Today I'm down in San Diego County at the San Onofre Nuclear Power Generating Station. This place is in the process of being decommissioned. And so I'm curious to see what goes into decommissioning a site such as this and how radioactive areas of it are. I mean, if you're not familiar with the, with the operating principles here, the uh, heat source is the reactor with the fuel in it inside the containment building. Um, that serves as, a, as the heat source to supply uh, heat hot water to the steam generators, big boilers. And inside the boilers, uh, you create steam, right? This is the secondary loop. That steam uh, is processed through a turbine, spin the turbine, make electricity, connect it to the grid for our customers. Well, the steam uh, exits the turbine and exhausts to a condenser, and it becomes water again, mm -hmm. okay? Condensate, as we call it. And that condensate is treated through uh, these full flow demineralizers to take out any iron or copper or anything like that might be inside the water and then that water is uh, returned to the steam generators through a feed water system and that's basically a closed loop it continues while we operate uh, the plant and make electricity okay the plant would operate on a cycle of about 18 months of running continuously at 100 percent power then we would shut down the shut down the plant uh, dismantle the reactor enough to remove the fuel Replace the fuel, replace some of the fuel assemblies, and then you know, or restore the reactor, heat it back up again, and start over and run for another 18 months or so. So now, how long would the refueling process take? Uh, on this plant, it took about two months to go through the whole process. And while we were refueling a reactor, we'd be on this side of the plant doing maintenance on a turbine and other systems as well. Uh, today, I think there's probably involved on. For all our operations, probably about 400 people, 450, okay. something like that. Wow. It varies wow. day to day. Yeah. But um, so this was a pressurized water reactor. This is the San Onofre plant was a pressurized water reactor. Okay. This is units two and three. Over there used to be unit one. Okay. The site was we started developing this site in 1964. Built unit one, operated it until 1992. Shut it down. And then we dismantled it mostly in the early 2000s, okay? And, and it's, in its place, we built a dry storage facility for the storage of uh, spent nuclear fuel. So that's what exists on that location. Over here, starting in the mid-1970s, we started developing this site to construct units two and three. And uh, these sites were built together and came out of the ground together here. And uh, they went operational and. Uh, 82, 83, 83, 84 time frame. I forget the exact dates. Okay, and they operated until 2012. 2012, we had some issues with the new steam generators we installed here. And uh, after uh, some consideration uh, for about a year and a half, we decided the most economical thing we could do would be to shut the plant down and move into decommissioning. Okay, so that brought us to where we are today. Um, we started this active dismantlement work in uh, 2020 after we went through a very rigorous environmental review with the state of California. And so that was with the state of California, not the NRC? No, the NRC, we already had the approvals we needed from the NRC to start, but we needed approvals from the state. California Coastal Commission, California State Lands Commission, we needed their, uh, their reviews and approvals, and we finally got through all of that and finished with it in 2019 and then we started the you know the real work in 2020. Plants built on Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. Uh, Edison leases this property from the Navy uh, for the for the purpose to operate you know nuclear plants here. So you know we're in the process of dismantling the plant then restoring this site uh, to a condition that's going to be acceptable to the Navy take the site again uh, when we're finished here. The United States government's responsibility to come take the fuel, find a repository for it, and then take the fuel from all nuclear plants. Okay. And uh, so far they failed on their responsibility. So until they, they uh, figure that out, uh, the fuel's kind of stranded here, like it is at all commercial nuclear plants. The, the non-radiological parts are all easy compared to everything else, right? Uh, Every, everything has its difficulties. Uh, I wouldn't say the radiological side's any more difficult. Some different methods are employed to control contamination and so on. Yeah. Okay. And now what are like usually like the contaminants you have to deal with like in that environment? Um, actually, this is a very clean plant compared to some, some nuclear plants. But um, mainly cobalt-60, some cesium, 
those would be the things uh, from a radiological point of view that we would be most concerned with controlling the contamination. And that's all just from neutron activation of the metals. Well, activation of uh, uh, materials, you know, contaminated, basically metals that are that are, uh, you know, in the plant. Okay. You know, corrosion products, for example, is where most of where the cobalt 60 comes from. So you have wear of pumps and valves, and that that wear uh, has cobalt in it. The cobalt gets in the in the um, in the nuclear steam supply system. It becomes activated. That's where the cobalt's coming from. So now, what's this? Why would, why would this be radiological? Like, why they have tags on them? It's really just potentially contaminated. We just have oh, abundance of caution. We've got a uh, tag like this. Okay. This is just part of the, uh, this is, where we're standing is part of the intake structure. Okay, so we drew, when we were operating the plant, we drew water in from the ocean through some long conduits that are installed offshore. Mm -hmm. That water uh, flowed in here and then went to unit three or unit two to cool the condensers and then it was discharged back to the ocean. So that was basically an open loop to the ocean. Okay. Okay, so that was its whole purpose was to cool the condenser. Now, so, you know, the, um, the plant generated about 1150 megawatts when we were for electrical power, but to create 1150 megawatts, you need about 4,000 megawatts of thermal energy. So it turns out that on like all these plants, most of the, most of the energy ends up going to the ocean, the heat sink because they're only about 30 to 33 percent efficient. Wow. Okay. That was, that's a, that's, if you had an oil-fired plant, it'd be the same, or a coal-fired plant, it'd be about the same efficiency. So we no longer bring water into the plant to cool it. We don't reject any heat now to the ocean. All this system is isolated, basically, So now, how much ocean. heat actually was it, like, that would come, like, from the plant back into the ocean. Like so what, there was a small, the there was a small temperature us? rise in the water that we uh, deposited back in the ocean, mm -hmm. just a couple of degrees. Oh, wow, okay. that's not bad at all. Because <laughs> it was distributed through a bunch of diffusers on, the, on these conduits. Okay. Okay. We're processing about one million gallons per minute per unit when we were operating. So about wow. two, a lot of water. There were huge pumps that were installed here, or just beyond those walls. There's, big circulating pumps that were used to move the water from the ocean through the condenser and then back to the ocean. In this area, it's been removed now, but in this area is where the traveling screens were to take out any debris that was in the ocean water, like seaweed, for example. We would also entrain some fish, right? Those fish would collect there, unharmed, and this elevator would lift them and sluice them back to the ocean through another conduit. Wow. So that was continuously happening, right? So any fish, turn to the ocean basically unharmed. Now also sometimes marine mammals would come in, like sea lions. Wow. They would enter the conduits way offshore, take a ride down here, and end up right over there. Oh man. And it was like a smorgasbord, right? Yeah, I bet. Right? So they would be consuming well, fish. Probably one one learned about that and they're like, hey, we're gonna They go would to come the back. We would we would capture them. You see that cage? Yeah. Okay, so we would get, we would collect the marine mammals when they did arrive here in these cages and then take them on a truck and put them back in the ocean someplace, right? And uh, sometimes they would return, you know, they didn't find their way back. <laughs> so now everything below ground is going to be backfilled with concrete, right? Not with concrete. In this area, we're going to fill this area with concrete because we need a good solid surface to work off of. But the rest of the voids that are remaining after we complete this phase of decommissioning will be backfilled with native soils from here on site. So Drew, this is the uh, Unit 3 turbine building. You can see it's, this part of it's largely intact. That's what Unit 2 looked like just a few weeks ago. So now with these cranes, what were these primarily used for? To service uh, the turbine generator for maintenance. Okay. The, the turbine rotors and the generator itself. So when we would shut down for the refueling outages, uh, we would dismantle you know, parts of the turbine, the generator, inspect, and then restore it. Because you know it, we wanted it to operate reliably for like 18 months continuously. Mm -hmm. These are remnants here of the uh, Unit 3 turbine rotors. The contractor's been cutting these up into manageable pieces. You see how big those components are. They're huge, right? At one time, you see all this scrap over here? They, they were uh, basically turbines, right, with different stages. 
and they were like huge wheels that would spin uh, when steam was admitted to them. And you can just see what's remaining here of all of this steel. So again, all this stuff, it gets, gets chopped up into smaller pieces, and then it's gonna be sent off site to be recycled. So it's just primarily steel? Just steel, okay. yeah, carbon steel. So this is what's left of uh, the turbine. It's been uh, cut up pretty good and it is massive. There's a lot of material here. Uh, kind of a loss for words at uh, how incredibly huge all this is. And it's not until you're like really close up to something like this you can actually understand the scope and size of a power plant like this and how much energy it produced. It's very impressive. The steam generator had to be reliable in its operation. For it to be reliable, it can't vibrate. To make sure it doesn't vibrate, you need a substantial foundation for that machine. The bottom of the turbine building, the foundation, is 15 feet thick of reinforced concrete. And on top of that foundation were built um, pedestals, basically columns, that rose up from that foundation to support the turbine. The turbine was not supported off this steel you see here. It was supported independently off of these columns or pedestals as we call them. So that uh, created the, uh, the foundation so the turbine was reliable in its operation, okay? And it was a very well-balanced machine, again, so it doesn't vibrate and uh, operates reliably for like an 18-month run. It was rotating at 1,800 RPM um, and it was uh, generating voltage at 24,000 volts. And the output of, this, of the turbine generator was connected here to a huge transformer. And that transformer would boost the voltage up to 220,000 volts. And at one time there were power lines that connect, connected from the switch yard here to that uh, transformer. The voltage boosted here to the grid voltage, 220,000 volts, is connected to the grid, and then that's what was supplied to our customers. Of course, through a distribution network that reduced the voltage down to like what you use in your house, 120 volts or 220 volts, like that. So this switch yard today is really just an interconnect between Southern California Edison's transmission system and San Diego Gas and Electric's transmission system. They connect right here. So that's going to remain too. Everything else that you see here is removed uh, to at least three feet below where we're standing. Um, then what remains is cleaned up, decontaminated to meet NRC uh, license termination requirements. Then we're going to backfill everything. All the voids that, that we created will be backfilled with native soil. And then we'll stabilize uh, this area basically back at this elevation. And we'll wait for um, the government to do its job with the spent nuclear fuel, okay, to remove it from this site. Yeah, so this is a, a radiation area, radioactive material storage. You need a radiation exposure permit to go inside. You have to notify health physics uh, before entry, and you need health physics approval uh, to remove any of this material, okay? So this is a typical sign that you might find uh, for a radiation area here on site. This is a barrier beyond which, unless you meet these requirements, you're not supposed to go beyond that, that limit. So you guys have different color rope that signifies different things here on site. Yeah, this is yellow and magenta. It looks like the magenta is kind of faded out on this particular rope. It looks a bit more purple, but that's what this is. Yeah. Okay. So this is supposed to be a, a glass wall as it yeah. cuts. Like where you can look at it, you just can't cross it. You don't it. reach over yeah. it or yeah. anything like that. Yeah. Oh, there's definitely an increase here. Yeah, not a lot, but... Yeah, if you go right up to the... I mean, it's barely anything. Yeah, it's like maybe eh, almost probably like eight times above background. You know, you're measuring count rate. We usually yeah. measure millirem as the I know. we're using. So, yeah. you know, later today you can, Jeff will show you our meters and so on. Yeah, it was kind of cool with this one is I could actually switch it over to millirem yeah. and to counts and sieverts and grays yeah. and well, disintegrations. What was, the huh? what was the millirem? I think so 50. 50 yeah. 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 60. It's a 60 micro rim. Yeah. So I don't have a filter on here. Pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. But still, that's like, yeah. 
really, really low. <laughs> <laughs> Containment dome. That is a really substantial structure. It's an engineering marvel, actually. So it's about four feet thick. It's reinforced with steel. And then after it was constructed, it was tensioned. Okay, we call this a post-tensioned reactor containment building. See this buttress right here with the nipple sticking off the side of it? That's a termination point for, for tendons that stretched around the building. There's three buttresses like this, 120 degrees apart. So once that building was tensioned, it had the equivalent strength of about 12 feet of steel reinforced concrete. Substantial building. So why was it so substantial? Because inside the building was the nuclear steam supply system that was operating at very high uh, temperatures and pressures. So there was a lot of energy in the reactor coolant system. In an unlikely scenario where there was like a, a loss of coolant accident, where we had a sudden break in the reactor coolant system and the water escapes, would immediately uh, uh, turn to steam, you have a huge pressure event inside the building going from around ambient to up to about 60 PSI. So this building was designed to withstand those types of events. You know, you've heard of what happened at uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl didn't have a building like this. It was basically a tin structure, okay? Um, because they just had like a cover over the top of the reactor. It was like an industrial building, okay, unfortunately. And when, when things went wrong at Chernobyl, um, it didn't have a structure like this to protect uh, the environment from the consequences of what's happening inside. So here we, we have a substantial building, lots of concrete, able to withstand the event, and it provides a lot of shielding too, okay? So you're asking why do we have that, uh, that uh, place where we obviously made an opening. Back in uh, 2009 uh, and 10, we replaced the steam generators in units two and units three, okay? The steam generators are big components. They weigh about 550 tons. It was too big to fit through the equipment hatch, which was just below this area. So to, to uh, support the process of replacing the old steam generators with new ones, we had to make this opening. So to make the opening, we had to detension the building, remove the tendons, make the opening, replace the steam generators, then form this up, replace the rebar, place the concrete, let it Cure, and then we could retension the building. So that's why you see that scar, if you will, up there. That's so how long did that whole process that take? That took about 100 days per unit. Wow. Okay, with a very large force of uh, people working here and a very super detailed schedule of uh, many thousands of activities that had to be very carefully coordinated. It was quite a big project. That's why when we had the problem with these new steam generators, um, they're, they're custom made components They've got about a five-year lead time, and then you have to go through a replacement process like this. It became uneconomical for us to uh, consider to uh, you know, keep the plant here and wait for new ones to show up to replace them. So that's why we decided to shut the plant. I'm curious though, because like, that, that was like right around the same time as like, because what, Fukushima was in 2011, 2011. Right? Yeah, and so I was always kind of curious, I'm like, was there like just a ton of pressure from the community, from the local government, from all this other stuff also. So like Southern California Edison was just like, you know what, fine. We'll listen to you guys since you guys are crying over this so much, we're just gonna give you what you want. Uh, no, not really. Okay. Um, what, what, what really transpired here was yes, by the, when we had the problems with the steam generators, that occurred in 2012. And as we investigated and understood better what had happened, uh, yes, there was members of the public here that didn't want the plant to continue to operate. But they never uh, wanted it here in the first place. Some people didn't, <laughs> but there were other people that were either ambivalent about it or were supportive. So you had a whole range of opinions. But there were people here that didn't want it, and that, that, that's absolutely true. Um, but, you know, from a technical perspective, we felt that we could have restarted the plant and operated at a lower power level and continued to operate. But that, that uh, convincing the regulator that, that we were able to do that became very hard and uncertain. So we finally just said it's better just to move on. And that's, that's what we did. Yeah, I was just always was curious about that because it was like such an interesting time period right there for nuclear energy because everyone was like, Germany was 
shutting down so many of their plants and all this stuff and then this happened and I was just like well how much of this has to do with that so yeah. you know it has fast to do forward, with Fukushima. fast forward to today and it's a different different thought process oh, about exactly. nuclear today right? yeah especially in Western Europe right now where there's a huge energy crunch right imagine if those nuclear plants were still available and operating today what would be the you know what would be the political uh, issues around what's going on in Europe today. You know, when you make these decisions, you don't know what the future holds either. So, so now, how are they going to uh, take down these vessels? Because I was, I was understanding they were going to do it from the bottom up. Correct. So that's the plan. How does that work? Yeah, that's pretty. Because that cool. sounds engineerily challenging. Uh, well, imagine what it would take if you try to do it from the top down. The true. Okay, it'd be pretty hard to do, and we had to ha ha manage all that material. If you do it from the bottom, you basically just hammer at the building from the outside with those big excavators, and from the inside too, until you weaken this structure to a point where it just basically collapses. Okay, so uh, just weaken the structure in lifts of like six to eight feet or so, give or take. Um, the building building settles, muck out all the concrete and rebar dispose of it and do it again. You do it over and over and over again and eventually the building is gone. It's pretty cool actually. Now how long would that take? How long is that process slated um, to take? I don't remember precisely but it's in the neighborhood of about uh, nine, nine months to a year to remove the building. Wow. This level of around 800 counts per minute is about 20 times above background radiation. And the type of radiation that I'm more than likely detecting is from gamma radiation based off the type of contamination that's here on the site. But now to put things into perspective, let's go to another location. This is the Adamson House in Malibu, California, not too far away from San Onofre. I'm actually getting a higher level of radiation here at this fountain than what I was at San Onofre. And that's because these tiles actually contain uranium in the glazes, which make them radioactive. Granted, the type of radiation that is coming off of these tiles is mainly beta radiation, whereas the type of radiation I was detecting in San Onofre was gamma radiation. So this building here, this is the uh, fuel handling building for Unit 3. So this is a truck bay, this area. When new fuel arrived on site, it would come on a flatbed in specialized containers, okay? And then they would be, uh, the containers would be lifted here through this small hatch, that hatch there, into the fuel handling building. Fuel assemblies would be inspected and then placed in the fuel pool, okay? And then those new fuel assemblies would be used in the reactor and they would be used maybe three times for three cycles. So, you know, assume three 18 month cycles. Wow. Typically, two to three. And then so they, they just kind of rotate them where they yeah, are. Yeah, they in would the move them around. They would change the core configuration every refueling outage, replenish it with some new fuel, and discharge the old fuel that was used up. Okay. So then the, there's a refueling pool here in that side, right? I just mentioned it. Um, the uh, the pool, the top of that deck for the pool is about the 63 foot elevation. Again, 33 feet above us. It's full of water, demineralized water that kept the fuel cool while it was there. So that water was circulated through heat exchangers when we were operating through heat exchangers and the heat was eventually discharged to the ocean. The heat, not the water. Yeah. Okay. Uh, after we shut down the plant, we, they're not here anymore, but we installed some uh, basically air conditioning units, big refrigeration units that were here. And we used those to cool the, the pool water until we could get all the fuel out, okay? And in the dry storage. Okay, so that's that's what this building was used for housing new fuel and uh, used fuel and then what we call spent fuel and then eventually today they're empty of the fuel. We all that's left in there now is water. That hatch is where the canisters of spent nuclear fuel, the dry storage canisters, they would be filled under water in this building. They'd be taken out of the pool the water will be discharged from the canister, the canister will be dried, 
a lid like this about nine inches thick would be welded on the top of it then the canister would be handled through this hatch onto a waiting transporter here and then hauled over to the uh, dry storage facility where it will be placed inside of a vault wow we call this a restricted area okay but it doesn't have any nuclear security uh, attributes to it today that's because all the spent nuclear fuel has been removed okay and after it was removed we uh, reduced this area to what we call a restricted area before then when we had fuel here it was called a protected area and uh, the ability to get in here was very very restricted and controlled and the perimeter of this entire site from the seawall around here to the north side there was guarded by this fence and this fence was an active fence if you approach the fence it would alarm and there's camera systems no longer in use but you'll see cameras all over the place here that were monitored uh, looking for you know any potential intruders that were to be trying to get into the plant so uh, the plant was very well guarded from a nuclear safety point of view when we were operating and while we had spent nuclear fuel here today the only protected area that remains for the plant is around the ISFACY, so when or dry storage facility you know if you want to take a radiation measurement oh yeah i love to uh, I, hear, I hear something else. It sounds like a ludlum in here. Oh, there it yeah, is. Right there. <laughs> I noticed that chirp. Nothing at all. Yeah, that's that's background. Yeah. 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 Now, if you were able to get past this, you can see inside. We've actually removed some of the internal bio shield walls already, and even even though those really thick structures are removed, you're not seeing any appreciable change in radiation out here. Since this video is getting a little long, I'm going to split this trip into two parts. The second half is going to be dealing with the radiological controlled area, or the RCA, where we get scanned a couple times along with our camera gear before entering and exiting. It's like the beginning of the running man. And in this area, we get to see the spent fuel pool. And then we get to take a trip out to see where the spent fuel now resides. So if you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.